welcome to the Life and Listings podcast. I am super excited to welcome Eric here. Hey, Eric, thanks for stopping by today. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. It's a pleasure. So for those people that are listening in that haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and what you're doing. Yeah, I am I am a, a real estate coach as well as a real estate professional. So I have the unique perspective of seeing both sides of the business from the coaching perspective and from actually being out there and doing deals. So I've been doing residential real estate for almost 20 years, and I founded Archway Partners about 18 months ago, coaching small groups one-on-one skills-based coaching and some asynchronous content as well. Amazing. We're super excited to dive into some some content today that by the time this releases is going to be so useful to everybody's business because as we all know, because it's been the like, you know, hot word of the, you know, to mass fault, but we're in a shifting market. We have a lot of different things kind of going on. So one of the things we want to talk about today was just how it's so important to know your value and have a really clear value proposition. You're coaching on this now and you said you did a class today. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think that for so long, especially for agents who have been in the business for less than four years, for the last four years, it has been not as prevalent or not as necessary for agents to really be clear on how they develop, develop and, and deliver a clear value experience to a client. And we're seeing now in this shifting market how incredibly important it is for us to be clear on what we deliver, what benefits we have to offer, but not only that, how to connect those benefits to the specific decision maker to whom you're pitching. Right. And I think that that's what's missing oftentimes is a lot of agents, they have their buzzwords, they have their keywords, they have their few things that they like to say in a pitch or in a listing presentation or or a buyer representation meeting, but they're not really understanding who the client is, what the client's pain points are, what they want, what they need. They're not listening to the client in order to really connect that value proposition to them. So what you're saying is that you don't want an agent just to come up with a generic value proposition, you want them to connect on a very personal level to what they're looking for and connect it back to themselves for what value they're adding. So then they can, you know, in turn, you know, charge for their services. So how, yeah, how do you coach around that? Like, how are you teaching people? I mean, obviously you need to know human connection, but like, how are you workshopping that with someone? Well, you just said it, that the, the, the differentiator between a value proposition and a pitch is very, very important. You know, it's not something that's generic, that idea that if I met somebody in an elevator, what would be my one minute pitch about my product or my service that would get them to understand that I have something of value to offer them? Yeah. A value proposition really starts with the other person and says, what is the problem and how can I help solve it? What, what solutions do they need me to help solve? And why am I uniquely qualified to do that for them? That's what a value proposition is. And as, as, as you said, you mentioned that, that in some cases now with the, with the changing landscape, it may not be that, you're, that you have a buyer paying a brokerage commission to their buyer rep. It may not be that that's the end result, but you certainly have to prepare for that. Yeah. You have to start the relationship with the client where they understand very clearly on um, what you're bringing to the table, why you earn the commission that you earn, and 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 how the different structures might play out. But if you're if you're going the old route where it's basically like I'm free and therefore you should choose me, that's that's the greater fool's theory, right? There's always going to be someone who's willing to do it for less. The question is, if you had to charge a full fee to a buyer, why would they hire you? Yeah. What is it that you're uniquely qualified to do to solve their problem? So essentially, I, I, I kind of break it down into, into five very easy key steps. And one is you have to understand what a cost-benefit analysis is. So understand the variables. You know, value is benefits over cost. And when we understand that equation, then we can say, all right, you, we know that value is subjective. So now I've got to understand the decision maker behind the V in my, yep. in my equation to understand what it is that they want. Then I have to be very clear on what is an actual benefit versus a feature, being punctual or having a great marketing team. Those are features. How does it create utility to the to the decision maker? What can they do with it? That's a benefit. And then the cost is, of course, not only the cost of your services, whether you're a listing agent, 
charging a fee for a listing to, to represent a, a seller, or whether you're a buyer who's setting up a listing buyer representation agreement that includes a fee, there's a cost there, obviously. But then there's also another cost that every decision maker is trying to work through, and that is what is the cost of doing business with you versus someone else? I, am I losing? Am I am I increasing my level of risk? Am I increasing my time commitment? Is this going to be more or less difficult? What am I getting in relation to to what I'm paying? And it's not only the physical or the actual money, but it's also the cost of doing business. Yeah. There's so many different levels to that because I think training agents or working as an agent, because I used to be an agent too, you, you would go into you would go into some of these negotiations with a buyer or a seller and you would give them kind of like a net sheet. It's almost similar to that, right? You're selling them like what it, these are all the services I offer. This is why I'm different. This is what I charge. Here's all the different things. And and I think we did have a fairly easy market over the last couple of years where we kind of lot yeah. of that. We left that on the listing agents. The listing agents go in with a presentation, right? Yeah. They, they yeah. have their value from Exactly. Now we need to have the buyer's agents do that. So yeah. do you feel like there were buyer's agents that did this prior to this? Yes, yeah. the, there there were. And it's interesting, you know, in the New York market, in New York City, I, I, teach a, I teach two different negotiation courses and I teach them nationwide, especially now that we're live, now that we have Zoom and we can do things virtually, right? Yeah. Before the pandemic, all of my classes were live. And I would always have pe- a few agents from New Jersey, from Long Island, from upstate, and then I'd have my, my New York City agents. And when I would ask the question about buyer representation, whether people are using a representation agreement, Everybody in New York City would say, no, I'm not, I don't use one. The people people reject them outright. They don't let yeah. me even talk. About it. And then you'd see the people from New Jersey, from Connecticut, from Long Island, from upstate, they'd turn and they go, wait a minute, are you all crazy? What? You're not using buyer representation agreements? Yeah. So there absolutely are people using them. Some of them, to be clear, were, hey, I'm going to represent you. It was much more of a fiduciary thing. It was more of of, of creating that that agency relationship. But they weren't in, they were they weren't including any if the if the seller is not willing to pay a commission or if the seller only pays X amount, then I'll collect the rest from you. Some of them didn't have any stipulation around commission. That's going to change. Everybody's going to, or in my opinion, everybody should. And that's where value proposition becomes. So incredibly important because if we're all going to be starting to do this with our clients, the real question becomes who is going to establish the highest level of value so that a buyer can see a reason to take the risk of potentially coming out of pocket to pay the best agent to represent them. Somebody who's going to actually negotiate on their behalf, someone who's going to advocate for them, somebody who's going to protect them and serve their interests in terms of risk and protection, because that's one of the biggest value elements there is in any negotiation is the risk that someone takes on. Absolutely. And and I agree. I, As we were kind of going through this shift, and you know, we're talking to a lot of our different clients, some are like, I'm not worried about it. We've always done this. There's, there's no change in the way that our business is run. And then other ones yeah. going, I'm really panicking because I've never even au- tried to ask for a buyer's representation agreement. So it's a mm-hmm. little bit of shift, right? Depending on where you're at and how your contracts have been written Traditionally, or even if you did have that, because a lot of us did have a buyer's representation agreement drawn up somewhere in our forms, we probably never pushed for it. So, and I want to touch on the negotiation part because in my feeling, the way that things are kind of going to kind of go is you're going to be negotiating with your client, but then you're also probably going to be a, a stronger level of negotiation with the listing agent and the seller. So let's touch on that because obviously you coach to that quite a bit too. Like, how do you see that playing out? Well, First of all, I think you bring up a great point, and that is the fallback position that I always coach my negotiation clients and my and my coaches around negotiation is if you need to have a fallback position with your own client when you're negotiating with your buyer or with your seller, that fallback position is look, I know, you know, I know that this is we'll figure this out. This might this is not the most comfortable conversation to have because we want to make sure that we're all doing everything as collaboratively as we can. But rest assured. When I'm out there doing this work for you in the field, you're not going to be there in the same room with me. You need to know that whoever you hire is going to be able to advocate for your interests. And if I can't even advocate for my own, how am I supposed to advocate for yours? So anybody who's not willing to negotiate with their own client is is showing their cards of how they're going to negotiate when the client is not there in the room with them, in my opinion. 
So it can be a really big eye opener for a client to see, oh, this person actually has minimums, maximums, and goals. They're actually concerned about what it is, is their minimum goals and satisfying at least their minimum goals in a negotiation here. And they're also being collaborative about how to find creative ideas and ways to get it done. So there is a strength in showing your client how you negotiate with them so that they know that you're going to be doing the same thing when they're not there. But I also think it's going to play out. I think that there's going to be a couple of other benefits that I've chatted with a, uh, with, with a few other managers and sales directors. One of the benefits I think we're going to see is you know how there's a lot of fear from buyers, agents, and buyers that if they had an agent, the listing agent wasn't going to work with them because they were going to be sharing part of their commission so if they went alone, they thought in some world that the seller's agent or the listing agent would take less of a commission and they could actually get a better deal. That was just the wisdom that the misunderstanding that a lot of buyers had yeah. is that somehow they were going to get a better deal by going directly to the listing agent. Well, if we decouple commissions or when we decouple commissions, because we have, now all of a sudden there's going to be less, there's going to be less of that behavior. If it's true, listing agents are not going to be as incentivized to try to keep both sides of the deal because- there may not be another side of the deal, mm -hmm. right? So now it may be more beneficial to a listing agent to actually have a competent agent on the other side of the deal yeah. so that they can share the work, right? Yeah. And I think that that's a, something that we're not really talking about a lot. If we get rid of this idea that uh, listing agents are going to try to collect both sides of the deal, now all of a sudden they're incentivized to want to encourage their client to work with someone who's represented. Yeah, that's such an interesting point because, I mean, I, I know I've been stuck in that position many a time where I'm working with someone and they go direct because they think they're going to be, or they do, right? The listing agent does in, indeed reduce their commission so they can get a, a lower a split. But, you know, showing the value there where it you need to be using a buyer's agent. I mean, it's protecting you yeah. in many ways. There has always been a cost there, but now we're just kind of, you know, differentiating it a little bit. And I want to go back to the point because I feel like this was so strong in telling your clients that me negotiating with you is actually showing my negotiation skills, right? Yeah. That is so true because on yeah. the flip side, you want your buyer's agent strongly negotiating for you, obviously. So if I'm not doing that during when I'm negotiating my commission, how I pay my family and I feed myself, how am I going to be doing that? for you and yeah. really showing them that that's so important. 100%. And, and especially if you can keep it collaborative and you can keep it light and you can understand if the other person is a little uncomfortable because negotiating commission, negotiating terms of a listing agreement, all of those value elements that come into play, not every seller, if we're, if we're talking about a relationship with a seller, not every seller is comfortable having that conversation. They feel very uncomfortable even asking it, but they feel that they need to ask it. And if we enter that negotiation with our client with a level of collaboration, understanding, putting ourselves in their shoes, acknowledging the, that, that it might be a little uncomfortable, but saying, hey, look, this is a very important conversation that we're having here because we need to figure out whether this meets both of our, our goals, whether we can find a zone of possible agreement and agree on whether this relationship is going to work. And if you can have that negotiation with your client, then they see that you're not going to be the kind of negotiator that first just doesn't negotiate or that gives away um, all of the, the information that you're supposed to be protecting on behalf of your client. But they'll also see that you're not going to drive people away by being a hard bargaining, inti using intimidation tactics and bluster to try to get your way. Because that oftentimes ends with buyers and buyer's agents saying, this isn't something I want to deal with. So uh, hopefully an owner would like to see, some of them want you to be a little bit firm and a little bit brusque, but for the most part, if you can show them that there's value to be created in a collaborative relationship. So this is how I'm going to approach the other side. We are going to get the, ma the most that we possibly can, but I'm not going to drive people away. I'm not going to make people feel small. I'm going to collaborate with people so that we can get as much interest and as many deals on the table as possible so that you get the most possible gain for our side. Do you feel like, I mean, this kind of brings up something in my mind. Do you feel like this is a good way for, I mean, agents in general, but you no, know, we're talking uh, buyers agents. Do you feel like this is a good way for us to kind of negotiate or the way that I see July playing out is I think we are going to see a lot of agents panicking. I see a lot of agents 
possibly cutting their commission quite low. You know, we are to the point where there's going to be some really very inexpensive agents that maybe don't have a lot of experience. Do you feel like an experienced agent could kind of argue or negotiate against that going, you know, if this person is willing to work for X amount, let's talk about and compare our value, our negotiation skills. Do you feel like that's where that conversation can kind of go in a successful way? Yes, absolutely. Because, and one of the, one of the nuances I think for a skilled agent is going to be, because you're right, there are going to be agents who they, they may be forced to have a buyer representation agreement with their client, but they're going to have it with one day terms or one week terms or one property terms. Yeah. They're not going to include any protection for commission. So it's like, whatever the seller is willing to give, I'm willing to take. Yeah. And that has the risk of driving down what buyer's agents earn even if they're worth more. So it's incumbent, in my opinion, upon the, the really skilled agents to focus the buyer on what they're going to get in terms of benefits between an agent who's just willing to take whatever they get, the difference, the delta between that number and what I charge. Because it, you know, it's not, it's not X percent that's at issue. If we don't want to use percentages, let's just say I charge X percent yeah. working with a buyer, right? So this is my fee. And if, and if the seller offers Y, I'm going to collect X minus Y. That's what I will collect, right? Yeah. But if there is a buyer's agent who's just willing to collect whatever is given to them, it's not that we're we're not talking about um, the entire commission. We're talking about the small difference between what they might not pay another agent and what they might have to pay us. Yeah. They may not have to pay me a dime. And I hope mm-hmm. that my client doesn't have to come out of pocket to pay my commission. Yeah. But Whatever they do have to come out of pocket to pay my commission is 100% worth it, and then some. Yeah. And if I can convince them of that small percentage chance that they'll pay something out of pocket, and also that that amount that they're going to pay out of pocket is not going to be the total amount, it's probably likely to be a portion of that amount. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, bridging that gap and the client starts to see, what kind of money are we really talking here? And how much are we really willing to risk to not have Eric? representing us. What does that cost us? And, you know, we've all had that conversation with buyers and sellers, you know, to, to kind of use the fear of loss when we're pitching them when you're delivering a value proposition. We'll say, you know, what is it worth to go down the path with somebody who's not prepared, who's not skilled? How much is that worth? And they start to think in their head, like, what, what could I possibly, how much could I lose if I don't have somebody who's willing to negotiate on my behalf? Is it 2%, 3%, 5%? Yep. What is that cost compared to the fraction of that that they may may have to pay me in order to make sure they have good representation? Yeah, because I know we've all been on different ends of the deal where I could see that them having X Y Z agent representing them cost them, and I could I could see the numerical yeah. value that it was at the end. And so I think that's su- such a strong conversation to have that your representation does in fact matter. And it does in fact cost you much more than commission if you have the right wrong or right person on your, your side of the table for you. So. Yeah. And that's, and that's what we add to the C in the, in the, in the benefits in the value proposition equation benefits of relative to cost benefits over cost. It's not just the finance. It's not just the dollar amount. It's also all of those intangibles of what it costs for them to work with someone else rather than you. Or you versus somewhere else, someone else, yeah. right? And that's why value proposition is so important. Is that they're calculating subconsciously or consciously? They're calculating the cost, financial cost, as well as all of those other costs that might come into play um, if they hire you versus someone else. Such good information, and at such the the right time too. I mean, so many people need to hear this. All right, I'm going to pivot a little bit. What is your superpower? Ah, uh, that's a great question. I love it. I love it. I, I developed, this is not something I was born with. I developed this over time. Uh, one of my, I think one of my, if I can call it a superpower, I'm, I'm, it's a little bit weird for me to call it a superpower, but not taking things personally okay. has become one of the things that has made me stronger in every area of my life with my family, with my spouse, with my kids, with my mom and dad, with my clients. In every relationship that I have, professional or personal, sitting back and understanding, using strategic empathy, you know, all of that stuff to understand that the person who is saying something that I could may or may not take as offensive, you know, they don't want to pay me what I think I'm worth, right? 
or they they said something about my outfit, which I thought was offensive. This is not. It's it in most cases in our lives, the other person did not intend it with the offense that you took it. Yeah. And if we can sit back and really understand that most things that happen to us in life are far more personal to us than they are to the relationship that's happening there. And if we can let it go, the relationship changes in so many ways. And there's so many ways that you can create value, that you can grow the relationship, that you can move that relationship, that the other person can see that you give them deference and grace and all of those things. It really improves all of my relationships to just sit back and go, do not take it personally. Yeah. It's not personal. I think that is a superpower. Because that can ruin so many things, whether it's yeah. business, personal relationships, your own mental well-being, right? Like taking things right. really personal. And I think that's a, such a, a powerful thing to have. What may, what do you, where do you think that came from over time? Like if you weren't born with it, how did that develop over time? That's a really good question. I think on one level, my parents were great at helping me become a very confident and self-assured person. I think that I think that's part of it, that I was raised with a level of, of, of confidence that helps me know who I am. Yeah. But I think that's only, only a piece of it. I think when I really started getting into collaborative negotiation training, and this dates back to when I was a, a sales director, and I went from being an agent to a sales director and then back into the Agent. And when I started to really delve into the world of collaborative negotiation and to understand how much their value there is to be gained by, by just understanding that people act in their own interest. And that's what makes it not personal is that they're acting in their interest, you're acting in your interest, and that's the way the world works. So I think part of it came with really going deep into that, into that idea of, of collaborative negotiation training. That totally makes sense. You know, we all think yeah. that, that that person said this thing specifically to hurt our feelings when in fact they really weren't even thinking about us at all. They were right. thinking about something totally different and yet we take offense to it. It ruins our whole day. We've all been there, right? Yeah. So great. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This has been great. This is the best topic we've had, you know, in a while. This is so useful for everybody that's listening in. If anyone wants to follow you or reach out or get information, you know, where's the best pr place for us to, you know, reach out to? I know you have a freebie on your website that people can grab yep. based on today's call. So share us. Yeah. Share where that is. Yeah. And it's right in line with value proposition. And first of all, thank you for letting me share this topic. I, I agree with you. It is it's so incredibly valuable right now. So I, it's it's something that I'm passionate about, and it's and I've had a, a, a document that's free, a free download on my website on value proposition for a long time, and it's great. So if you go to archwaypartnersinc.com, that's archwaypartnersinc.com, you'll see in my you'll just you'll see it. There's a free download button. All you all I need is your name and email, so I can keep in touch with you, and you can download. It's about a 13 page document, all about understanding value proposition. And then follow me on socials at Eric the Expert, E-I-R-I-K. I have a strange <laughs> Icelandic spelling of my first name. So Eric the Expert, you can find me on, on most socials that way. Perfect. And I'll drop all of this in the show notes, whether you're listening on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. So thanks again for joining us on the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs>